Hello, Rudyard Griffiths here, the moderator of the Monk Debates. Welcome to these, our pre-debate interviews. We're spending a little bit of time with each of our presenters tonight just to get their thoughts on our debate topic, obviously the Russia-Ukraine war. My next guest is Michael McFall. He's a celebrated academic, some would say, I would probably say, the leading expert uh, in the United States on Russia. Uh, he has had a very uh, meritorious public service career, serving on the National Security Council, of President Barack Obama as a special advisor to the president on Russia and Eurasia, and also as the U.S. ambassador to the Russian Federation. He's currently teaching at Stanford University. He's a fellow at the Hoover Institute. And Michael, we're just so pleased to have you here in Toronto for this debate. I'm glad to be back. So uh, we are 80 plus days um, into this war. Uh, what surprised you so far? What surprised me most is the horrific tactics that the Russian forces have used uh, in fighting the war. Uh, uh, you know, we've seen these tactics before in other parts of history. Uh, Chechnya, for instance, uh, Syria, 2015. I just never thought that they would use those same kinds of tactics against Russians. Uh, remember, they are slaughtering civilians. They're killing, uh, you know, on purpose as a way to put pressure on President Zelensky. Uh, civilians, um, and they're doing it in the places that they claim to liberate. So I thought there would be a horrible, hard war. Uh, I, pred I thought that was going to happen. I thought it was going to be big, uh, tragically. I did not think that Putin would deliberately kill, starve, uh, you know, encircle the very people that he claims to liberate. And I want to emphasize these are ethnic Russians and Russian speakers that are the victims of this kind of fighting. Why do you think he's, he's doing this? If you feel that it was um, possibly extraordinary or outside of your previous perceptions of what he was capable of or what he would do in his own interest, why this escalation of this war, as you say, in these ways that have, I think, shocked the world's conscience? I don't know. That's a great question. Someday I hope Mr. Putin answers it. Um, if I would guess, it's probably out of frustration about how poorly his original objectives were not achieved, right? So remember, they thought this was going to be three or four days. They'd be in Kiev. Zelensky was going to be in Poland. They would put their own puppet regime in. And they really thought they were going to occupy the entire country, right? That was their expectations. By the way, lots of other countries uh, and lots of other experts had the similar set of assessments. So when that didn't work, uh, when denazification didn't work, that's regime change, uh, that didn't work. When they failed to take the major cities, and first and foremost, Kiev, uh, now you've shifted to this, this different kind of fighting in Donbass, uh, particularly I'm thinking about Mariupol, uh, where he just needs to win at all costs. And even in Mariupol, uh, as we speak today, he has been unable to dislodge the remaining fighters there, and so he's just decided to destroy the city. Uh, and by in destroying the city, that means destroying, uh, killing many innocent civilians as well. Let's uh, have you respond to some of the arguments that you're likely uh, to hear tonight from your, your debate opponents. Um, one of them is going to be the, the view that NATO and the United States in particular is somehow responsible for this war, that there were warnings when you were ambassador to the Russian Federation, when you were on the National Security Council, the Russians were drawing red lines around Ukraine. For whatever set of circumstances, um, those red lines were ignored. And after the Medan uprising, large-scale uh, weapons shipments from the United States and NATO were going into Ukraine, training of Ukraine forces by American troops. Uh, What's your view on that? Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of views. First, I think it's a cherry picking of history yeah. uh, to assume that NATO has been expanding since the collapse of the Soviet Union and it's been an existential threat to Russia. And finally, Putin just had to push back and fight back in 2014. That leaves out a lot of history. Uh, the way I read that history, and I lived part of that history in yeah. the government for five years, there have been ups and downs 
in U.S.-Russia relations and, and Russia's relations with NATO. Um, uh, there's been times of cooperation where we cooperated in Afghanistan, NATO, Russia, the United States all together. Uh, there's been times when we were having serious conversations with the Russians about missile defense cooperation. I know because I was there at the NATO summit in 2010 when Dmitry Medvedev, President Medvedev came and said, our problems with you are over. Uh, and we were literally talking about missile defense cooperation. So the, those that make this argument of this straight line of conflict, I, I see it's much more zigzag. I think the, the history is much more nuanced. And I think you have to ask the question, uh, what changed between 2010 when Medvedev came and there was all this happy talk at the Lisbon summit uh, in 2014, four years later, it wasn't NATO's policy didn't change. There was no change, uh, acceleration of Ukrainian membership into NATO. Nothing changed in, the, in regard of that. And you don't have to believe me, ask the Ukrainians. They were very frustrated by the fact that they were not given even a, a, a membership action plan, a pathway towards membership. Till to this day, they haven't even gotten one. What changed was things inside Ukraine, right? Uh, the, the Ukrainians call it their revolution of dignity. Putin calls it a neo-Nazi coup sponsored by the United States. That's what's changed, not NATO expansion. Uh, and that has been driving Putin nuts ever since. So in terms of red lines, he crossed red lines in 2014. Yeah. We fought World War II because we wanted to stop annexation in Europe. He's the one that crossed that line. And that has led to you know, a simmering conflict between him and the Ukrainians that he finally decided to try to resolve with military force. And even right up to the, the days, literally the days before he invaded uh, Ukraine a second time, I, I, I would call it an escalation of the, his invasion in 2014, NATO, President Biden, his team were still trying to negotiate some kind of settlement, uh, talking about his security guarantees. I know I talked to the president during that period. I talked to Secretary Blinken. Uh, the notion that they somehow were not trying to avoid war, I think, is just empirically incorrect. Do you think he had another objective, that this, yes. is, this is not about NATO? Then what is it about? So don't believe me. Read his speech. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really beg people to start listening to what Putin says mm -hmm. and stop treating Russia as some kind of abstract unitary actor that we can't, we can't understand, so we've got to treat it just as some theoretical case study. Read a speech, February 21st, uh, 7,400 word speech. The first 4,625, you see I've counted them, uh, are all about his, his problems with Ukraine as a separate nation all about that they, the, the Soviets, he blames Lenin, he goes on and on about Lenin being more <laughs> responsible for this than NATO. Uh, he believes that Ukrainians are just Russians with accents, uh, that they were never, they never should have been independent. Mm -hmm. That was a tragedy of yep. history and now he's trying to rewrite those tragic moments from before and he only mentions NATO 4,626th word. You know, 40 minutes into his speech, does he f finally get around to mentioning NATO as part of the problem? Fascinating. I did listen to that speech uh, subtitled, and it, <laughs> it was meandering. It was long. And interesting. But it was all about time. 18th right. century. It was about Novorossiya, yeah. what Catherine the Great did. And he was trying to, those people in southwest Ukraine, he says it right in the speech. He says, those were people, those were Russians in the Russian Empire. I'm now trying to bring that back. Right. So uh, there's the world with the way we want it, the way we find it right now. Um, a horrific war, a brutal war, no end in sight. Um, people blaming uh, in certain quarters, not just Russia for escalation, but escalation from NATO. There is an argument, I'm sure, again, yeah. you're aware of it, that, that NATO's, and particularly the Biden administration's uh, perceptions of what their policy is in Ukraine and what their desires are in terms of denuding Russian power over the long term, but not just economically, but militarily, yeah. has further stoked this conflict. Are you concerned that we are seeing an escalation of war aims and it's not just Russian war aims that are ratcheting up? Uh, I'm concerned, and I disagree with that. 
Uh, I do not think it should be the policy of the United States or NATO to seek to weaken Russia, destroy Russia, uh, wipe out Russia's military. I think the goal of American foreign policy should be to end this war. Um, and so I disagree with Secretary Austin. You're referring to his comments. By the way, uh, others in the administration disagree with that too. Um, uh, that said, I, I tragically believe that the only moment there's going to be a chance for peace is when there's stalemate on the battlefield. I think it is naive to think that if Putin is still taking territory, he's going to negotiate. That's not who he is. And by the way, that's not the way most wars end. They either end in one side winning or a stalemate. They rarely end when the, uh, the, the, those in the, in the battle think that they're still achieving their objectives through military means. He most certainly believes that he is right now. Uh, and so my view is we should stay to that policy. I think that's what the President Biden outlined. Uh, he also drew some red lines. No American pilots are going to be involved here. No American soldiers. I agree with him 100 percent on that. Uh, but I do think to try to end the war, arming the Ukrainians and sanctioning the Russians are you know, necessary, tragic, but necessary parts of that uh, to, uh, strategy to achieve that objective. Yeah. Um, you've had, and you've written extensively about this, you've had a, an interesting relationship with the current regime in Russia, with Putin. Uh, you were somebody that they identified and singled out as a, um, as a threat, as a threat to their autocracy, as someone who supported the very early democracy movements that came out of the collapse of the Soviet Union. When you look back over your engagement with Russia from that period, of the late 80s through to today. Um, what's, what's a lesson or two that you would, that you could provide people who are trying to think through this regime and this man? I mean, you've spent time with him. You've had conversations with him. Yeah. Very few people have. Um, it is a singular situation where we're dealing in a sense with one person persecuting a war who truly is its architect. Yes. And I assume you would agree that any solution to this war in some way is going to have to be negotiated, in a sense, directly with Putin. Yes. So tell us, Michael, how does, that, how does that happen? Is this a man who's capable of being brought to some semblance of, of reason and rationality? I don't know. Uh, but you said a couple of very important things I want to underscore before giving a guess to your last yeah. question. First of all, you very rightly said Putin versus Russia. And I think that's a very critical piece for understanding this conflict. This is not a fight with Russia and Russia's security interests. There are millions of Russians that disagree with this war, literally millions of Russians. There are prominent billionaires and there's Alexei Navalny in jail. Uh, he's Russian too. He has his definition of, of Russia's security interests. And he believes vehemently that this Putin's definition is not only bad for Ukraine and the West, it's bad for Russians. And I think he's right about that. Are Russians more secure because of this war? No. Are they uh, more prosperous because of this war? No. Uh, are Russians and Ukraine better off because of this war? No. And even if you believed uh, that, that NATO is the threat to Russia, uh, I personally don't, but even if that was your belief, what has Putin achieved from this war? He's unified NATO. He's resurrected NATO. You know, fin the Finns and the Swedes are now debating joining NATO. That's not a very strategic uh, approach. So I think it's really important for your, your viewers to remember, not all Russians think alike, and this, I I'm assuming not all Canadians think alike. Uh, I know that not all Americans think alike, so why do we presume that all Russians think alike? Uh, just because we, they're not, there's not a democracy there, we can't hear that. Uh, but it's Putin's war and Putin's in power. I, I don't see that changing uh, anytime soon. So I do think there'll have to be a negotiation. Uh, I think it'll have to ultimately be Zelensky and Putin at the table. Uh, when I was in the government, uh, whenever we did big deals with the Russians, it always eventually had to go to the presidents, either Medvedev or Putin uh, with President Obama. Um, and I think that hopefully will happen when both sides finally realize they cannot achieve military or economic or ideological objectives on the battlefield and the both sue for peace.
Okay, fascinating. So final question that I'm asking all the four presenters tonight, um, and just ask you to play along because it's a hypothetical, okay. and you're never supposed to answer a hypothetical. If you were to cast your mind forward five years from now, what do you think the relative you know, status of power and relations would be between Ukraine and Russia and Russia and NATO? What does that look like if it was a staircase? Is it a staircase you know, going up for Russia, down, and for those other two players, NATO and Ukraine? Well, it all depends on who wins. Uh, who wins in Donbass. Uh, and let, let, let me back up a little bit. I actually, I, I believe already Ukraine's won the war. So the war, Ukraine's al already won. They have denied Putin his main military objectives, right? Occupation, denazification, demilitarization, taking Kiev, Kharkiv. Those are, those are all things that he wanted to achieve. He hasn't. But there's still some battles left. Uh, and I think the battle for Donbass, that it's ongoing right now, will we'll answer your question. Um, if Russia wins uh, five years from now, our allies in Europe will be nervous. We'll be spending billions of dollars to try to reassure them. And I, I would guess that American soldiers are gonna have to be permanently stationed in those countries to reassure our allies. Uh, likewise, our partners and friends in the Middle East will be nervous about us and, and our partners and allies in Asia will be nervous about us as a guarantee for their security. But the opposite is equally true. If, if Ukraine wins in Donbass, uh, all those things, it's not just about Ukrainian victory, I think that reassures our allies in Europe uh, and reassures our partners and friends in the Middle East and Asia, because those they're all watching. Uh, they're all watching to see who wins the Battle of Donbass and then consequentially longer. But irrespective, I, I, but there's a third scenario, of course, which we already talked about, is that there's a stalemate and nobody wins Donbass. Uh, in that scenario, I think Russia is very diminished. Uh, Putin's reputation on the global stage is already diminished, and not just in Europe, by the way. That's easy. And here in Canada, I presume, that's easy. Uh, publicly, of course, you know, the Indians are neutral, the Chinese are with them. Privately, when I talk to people from those places, and governments and, and non-governmental people, they're all shocked at how poorly the Russian military has performed, and they're all saying, what was Putin thinking? Uh, so they've already lost that piece. Uh, second, uh, no matter what happens, the Russian military is vastly diminished already. It's gonna take them years to, to uh, recover from this disaster. And then third, the economy. Uh, sanctions are sticky. Uh, once they're in place, they're really hard to lift. Uh, and my prediction is that it's gonna take years, if not decades, for Russians to get to the same standard of living that they had the day before the war. So I think in the long, in five years time, uh, Russia's place in the world, uh, prosperity at home, and security are gonna be vastly diminished. Fascinating. Thank you for playing along sure. with me, yeah, Michael. Okay. I appreciate it. And thank and if you. I'm right, we'll find the tape. And if I'm wrong, <laughs> yeah, I want exactly. you to get rid of it. Okay? We'll get rid of it. Thanks All for right. coming to Toronto. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.